Good morning, everyone, and welcome to sepsis, sepsis syndrome, and septic shock. As you may have heard from the announcement, the lines are now currently muted. Uh, you may unmute your line by pressing star six. Uh, the reason we do this is just in case you have some background noise, it won't be shared by everyone uh, across the conference line. So let's go ahead and get started. Today we're going to talk about sepsis, sepsis syndrome, and septic shock. My name is David Woodruff, and I began my career as a paramedic, working out in the field for a number of years before I went to nursing school. That gave me the opportunity to be able to see the healthcare setting from the outside. So I got to see who was actually providing care to the patients, and it was the nurses at the bedside. I liked the fact that we were able to implement an intervention for our patient and actually got to see the outcomes of that intervention. So we got to see how our interventions actually affected the patient and how the patient recovered from the interventions that we were implementing. After nursing school, I worked in a variety of different settings, including coronary care, medical intensive care, surgical intensive care, neurointensive care, and a level one trauma center. I taught medical surgical nursing for seven years, critical care nursing for three years, and continuing education for the past 11. So I've got a variety of experiences I hope to be able to share with you today as we talk about sepsis, sepsis syndrome, and septic shock. Now hopefully everybody has received a handout at this point, if not, then give us a call at 800-990-2629 so that we can get the handout to you. Let's go ahead and get started. On the first page in your handout, page number one at the bottom, let's take a look at some of these different organizations that have more information for you to be able to support you in caring for your septic patient. So I have three organizations here that I'm going to show you about first thing as we get started. We'll talk more about them later as we go through the program. And then uh, these are additional places that you can go to get additional information when we're done. By the way, I will unmute the lines at the end of the program so that we can have questions and answers. So feel free to uh, write down your questions or keep them for a little while here until we get to the uh, toward the end of the program. And then I will unmute the lines so that we can have a uh, time for questions and answers. The first of these organizations that I'm going to show you here is sepsis.com. Now this is a website that was developed by the uh, drug company. I think it's Eli Lilly and they're obviously the makers of Zygris. Now sepsis.com has a lot of great information on this website about sepsis. They've got a nice animated cascade for sepsis, etc. So there's a lot of good information on here to help you to learn more about sepsis and septic shock. This is obviously the kind of place, too, you might want to keep as a reference around somewhere, just in case you want to go back to it at some point in time and revisit it and say, okay, what do we know that's new about sepsis, and what are we learning about sepsis uh, that we may want to find out more information about? So sepsis.com, great website to check out, lots of great information on this site that can help you in your practice. The second organization that you might find helpful in finding information about sepsis and getting especially information about the sepsis bundles is the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement can be found at IHI.org and they've got lots of great information on here. First of all, those of you who have been involved in things like rapid response teams and so on will probably know a little bit about the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. This is the organization that was basically kind of founded and kind of has organized all their activities around the document that was written uh, several years ago, uh, To Error is Human. Now, this document was a document by the Institute of Medicine that said that basically there's so many people who are dying needlessly in the hospital because of the care that we're giving to our patients. Okay, so this isn't they're just not like dying because they're real sick. It's because of the care that we're giving to our patients. So nosocomial infections, central lines that are getting infected or that are causing emboli and things like that. So that's the kind of stuff that they're talking about. Now, one of the things that they've grabbed onto here, too, is to be involved in this process of sepsis. How can we improve the care that occurs to our patients who have sepsis? Now, let me just give you some kind of historical background here on where we are with sepsis and sepsis care. These patients, 20, 30 years ago, these patients got septic and died. Okay, we didn't really have a whole lot of options for them. We didn't know how to treat it. As a matter of fact, you know, 20, 25 years ago, when a patient came in with sepsis and had septic shock, we felt that the patient had enough volume on board and simply was having a problem with vasodilation. So we would give these patients lots and lots of pressors. 
We didn't give them any fluids. We just gave them lots of pressors. What happened was that the patient would end up getting such massive vasoconstriction that within days they'd have black fingers and black toes, and of course their extremities were rotting off, literally, because they weren't being perfused. So we've come a long way in understanding sepsis and sepsis syndrome, septic shock, and finding out better ways to treat it. ARDS is a result of sepsis, and ARDS used to have a mortality of about 60, that's 60 percent. ARDS now has a mortality in general, just across the board, of less than 30 percent. And in some institutions, they have mortality from ARDS at less than 12 percent. Okay, so these things that we're doing obviously are having a big impact on the outcomes of our patients. So this here, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, lots of great information on this website. If you want to find out more about rapid response teams, about decreasing central line infections, about decreasing hospital-acquired pneumonia, and the new category, which we call healthcare-associated pneumonia. So all those kind of things you can find out more information about IHI because they are directly involved in trying to decrease mortality from all of these things. Now, they have sepsis bundles on their website. So you go to your website here, you search for sepsis, you come up with this page here. Lots of great information. If you go over to the left-hand side there and you're looking at the navigational pane, you'll see how to improve measures, changes, improvement stories, tools, resources, literature. So a lot of great information available there for you to help you to be able to implement these sepsis bundles and to improve care in your patients who have sepsis. Okay, let's go on to the third organization, which is the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign is an organization of the uh, European Society of Critical Care, the International Sepsis Forum, the Society of Critical Care of Medicine. So these groups have gotten together and formed this initiative to be able to train people about sepsis and what is the best care for sepsis. So there's a lot of good information on this website. There's also good patient teaching information. So it's primarily designed to help us to teach our patients about sepsis and septic shock, uh, but there's also some good information that you might be able to use in your practice here as well. So these are three organizations you might want to come back to to gain more information, get more insight into what is going on, and to keep, kind of keep your finger on the pulse of sepsis and what's changing in septic care. All right, let's flip over to page two then and talk about this whole process that we call sepsis syndrome. Sepsis syndrome is this whole process of sepsis, septic shock, etc. So now we, you may have heard these terms and you may have heard them thrown around before and thinking, geez, well, what is this whole thing? You know, I've heard of patients being septic. I've heard of patients having septic shock. What is sepsis syndrome? And where on earth does multi-organ dysfunction fit into this whole thing? All right, well, what's happening here is this continuum that you see illustrated in your handout. What it's illustrating is over on the left-hand side, we have some kind of initiating factor. For example, infection, injury, or ischemia. This is what's causing the process that we call sepsis. So your patient who's admitted to your floor with a urinary tract infection and urosepsis. Now, what that means is that either bacteria or a bacterial toxin got out of the bloodstream, I'm sorry, got out of that, that urinary tract and into the bloodstream. So bacteria, bacterial toxin got out of the urinary tract into the bloodstream and is now circulating around the bloodstream, which now, moving over a little bit more in our diagram, leads us to this thing called severe sepsis. Now, severe sepsis, septic shock, and multi-organ dysfunction, that's the mod support part there over on the right. Okay, those things are the result of the systemic inflammatory response. So notice in your diagram in the middle it says SEERS. SEERS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Okay, now what is that? Systemic Inflammatory Response. 